I would like to show you in what respect I hope that I can contribute to this uh, talk. Uh, I will use all kinds of words which were floating around even today in the papers, in the, in the contributions to this workshop. I would like to demonstrate how many different meanings they have got, how many concepts we attach to them. And I also would like to show in a way that by using these terms, probably by explaining them, by discussing them, how can we get closer to what we try to understand. Because I think that was one of the issues today which came up time after time that we want to get back to the Middle Ages, we want to get back to the early modern period, we want to get back to the 1910s probably, we want to understand how the monks were living, what they were doing, and of course we can't do that because we will never experience the same thing. I don't know whether you have heard about this that in America there was a reality show when people were put into a monastery because it's so strange. I mean modern people don't understand in principle this word. The second thing is that it is now in many ways rare and unique to meet a monk. I mean, imagine that you, you walk in 16th century Prague, or rather in 14th century Prague. Early 16th is a difficult period here, but 14th century Prague, there's a good chance that you will meet lots of guys, not so much nuns, in all kinds of different colored things, you probably will not be 100% sure whether it's a monk or a brother or a kind of ecclesiastic person, but you would understand that somehow coming from that. Now, this is gone. This is not anymore. You have to go to special places to see. And I, I have to say even that even in the present day church life, people very often, even those who are inside of these circles, very often they don't understand very often the meaning of these, the colors of these dresses, the meaning of them and so on. So whatever we want to do, we want to get back to this, but this is, this is a good effort. I myself doing this, but we also have to just keep in mind that in feeling, in time perception, I think in some ways we will never understand certain elements, but we want to understand more and more. So what I want to offer here, a few ideas to understand things. Now, how these ideas emerge, what I'm going to talk about, I read the abstracts in advance, I received them, so I started to think about it because I wanted to reflect on them. But I also would like to add to this that during the last two, three years, I've been involved in a research project which is very much shaping my ideas, which was about knowledge transfer in medieval monastic networks. This was a joint project between Central European University Medieval Studies Department and University of Dresden Institute called FOVOG, which is an institute of comparative order history. So that institution, our institution is an interdisciplinary medieval uh, institution dealing with any aspects of the Middle Ages. The other is dealing with monastic orders, but not with one or with the other, but comparing them to each other. And this was a cooperation of us in which we looked into different means and ways of knowledge transfer. I will come back to this point, what do we mean by knowledge transfer? And finally, my basic research is going on. I'm currently, and at the moment, not now, but when I go back, I'm working on an archaeological site, which is a Cistercian Grange. So it's not a monastery, it's a production center of a medieval Cistercian monastery, which was an economic center and a glass production center as well. So where issues like knowledge transfer, technology, production are 
absolutely crucial issues. So this is from where I'm collecting my examples, where I'm, I'm, what I'm using today, and these are the questions which emerge from this project. So this is the, the project uh, I mentioned, so it was communication and knowledge transfer in medieval monastic networks. And we asked a good number of things. We organized four workshops, each of them dedicated to a special aspect. So things like exchange of texts and manuscripts or books in monastic culture. I think this is one of the probably the best known aspect of knowledge transfer in monastic. This is a field which is in, in many ways quite traditional. It goes back nicely to 19th century scholarship and where you also have got lots of new things. You know, digital humanities, digital catalogs of libraries and things like that can help a lot in this respect. Then movement of objects. Movement of objects, like of course pieces of art, but as you will see, dirty, tiny little fragments of glass, which are proofs and evidence for certain type of exchange of things, not so much exchange of objects, but the exchange of ideas, knowledge, technology. Then it was transfer of cult of saints, which is so important. It's a field which is booming all around in Europe in research, and we have got great experts in our program who are dealing with that, so we decided to have that. But, and most importantly, even if we go back to the roots of monasticism, the most fundamental question is the transfer of complex knowledge about itself. What does it mean, monastic life? What is the regular? Is it a written text? Is it a daily practice? Is it transmitted orally? Is it transmitted in, in, in um, text, in books, in experience, by placing one abbot from one place to the other? So these are the issues. And these are also crucial because, as you will see, it's not simply the monastic tradition. It's absolutely crucial in Christianization, mission and transmission. To what extent mission is monastic or non-monastic? We tend to believe that, of course, it's monastic in some parts of the world, in some periods, and in other periods and other parts, it's not. So what is behind this? What are those basic ideas in the way of life, the driving forces, the principal ideas which are forcing these people to live according to the regular, according to the rules, how it is transmitted. So these were the questions we have asked, and this is what I was talking about. It's a medieval image. There are these kneeling and standing guys. I mean, they are all male, I think, yes. They all have very interesting dress, different in color and in some character, but it's in some way similar. And somebody who's learned it, who knows the history, who has been that can immediately tell, or not immediately, perhaps after long study, what represents what, who, is, who belongs to which order, and why that person is depicted in that way as it is depicted. So this is the idea behind. Now, that's about the idea of research, what influenced my way of thinking. If we look around, of course, there are lots of people who are dealing with the same problems, who are dealing not with medieval monasteries, but who are, for example, dealing with communication and transfer of information and knowledge. Now, if you look into that literature, that's my very simplified uh, idea, what I learned from some of these studies, that, of course, when you are, we are talking about transmitting information, there are different types of transmissions. We can transmit simple news, gossips, whatever, which is very simple. Here happened that. And you tell to other people or you use your mobile and you send it and that's it. And of course, it's interesting or not interesting, it has consequences or not, but it's simple. Now there is when the information is much more complex. I mean, you can transmit 
a, a beautiful codex with a good number of texts in that. For example, the collection of Cistercian hymns. And you take it from one place to another place. But that's not, you know, like news. It's much more complex. You cannot grasp it in the minute. You have to read it. You have to educate yourself. And there are even more complex things which we can call information packages. For example, when I say, I will argue that at one point, probably in a Cistercian network, the knowledge of grass production from a Czech or from a southern German monastery was taken to medieval Hungary into another Cistercian monastery. And when I say the knowledge of glass production, I'm talking about people who were knowledgeable. I'm talking about materials. I'm talking about probably texts. I'm talking about experience, daily work experience of one or rather more people and transplanting all this into a totally different milieu because they cut trees here, but they should cut trees there, but the trees are not exactly like here, the people are not exactly like here. So it's a transmission, it's a complex thing. So we are talking about exchange of objects, exchange of ideas, and exchange of complex information packages when it's object, person, experience, way of life, technology. And the more complex the knowledge is, the more complex means and the ways are behind the transmission. So it's not enough that you tell a, a guy that, oh, you should cut lots of trees and then make a kiln and then you melt the, the materials for the glass and then you blow the glass. From that, there will be no glass object because <laughs> it's, it's impossible. It's such a sophisticated, complex process that you really need to have years of experience, actually, to do that. So that is one aspect we have to keep in mind, because I would argue that the basic thing what we are dealing with, being a monk, is a complex knowledge system. So, because it's not simply that I'm praying and working. OK, but when? What? in which sequence, and what do you do when this happens, and what will happen if you are confronted with a situation like this. This is being a monk. So, now, about terms, because we easily use just terms, transfer, transmission, translation. So, for various reasons, I just looked into definitions explanations. First of all, I mean, please remark this. Basically, we are using Latin terms. All, I'm using English, my bad continental English, but we use this lingua franca to explain something where the lingua franca was very often Latin or Greek or church Slavonic or some other. And then when we turn to these issues from a scholarly point of view, we use Latin terms, but we don't use them in their original context, we use these anglicized Latin terms. So for example, if you look transfer, in psychology means change in learning in one situation due to prior learning in other situation. Did you think about this, that when we say transfer, we are thinking in some ways, yes, in some ways, not. What is even more interesting, the second part of it, that the transfer can be positive with the second learning improved by the first, or negative, where the reverse holds. So this is how psychologists are thinking about transfer. It's even more interesting that they are also using translatio in a totally different meaning. Now, if you have got basic Latin knowledge, you know that the two words somehow has something to do with each other. So even Latin words has got, can have different meanings, but are we really using these terms in what context? So, for example, translation, 
it's now not the Latin version, it's the English version now, means this, where you have got a target text or translation, and you have got the source text. And what is the most important thing, I copied it from a definition, it says the translation that communicates the same message. Now that's an ideal case. It's impossible. I mean, how can you communicate the same message about a monastic regula if you translate it to a newly Christianized group of people? I mean, it's impossible. The context is totally different. I mean, think about Christianization when you want to translate such simple words as God. But from a monotheistic to a polytheistic, or from a monotheistic to a shamanistic, the translation of God is in some ways impossible, because it's not translation, it's introduction of a totally new concept. And we are dealing with this kind of things in knowledge transfer, because knowledge transfer is not only this, that, okay, it's written in this way in this text, and we translate it into other or transmit or transfer it. So these are my, you know, problems. I'm just listing problems in this. Now, I leave this very philosoph almost philosophical type of approach. I go down to a very down-to-earth approach, which is much more proper for an archaeologist like myself. So, for example, you can use a spatial thing, because if you are talking about transfer or transmission, it's obviously, in most cases, it's not happening everything here. It has a space aspect. So when you transfer from here to next room, to next building, or to the other end of the world, like we have heard this afternoon, you transmit an idea from the Iberian Peninsula to Mexico. This is, this is an entirely different thing. Now, I just listed here three levels of, of things. Major historical geographical regions where we have got general trends. When we say the Mediterranean or the Holy Land or Western European monasticism or Eastern Church, things like that. Then we have got large monastic landscapes. Under monastic landscape, I understand a space which is defined by us in which we think that interactions are happening, which are shaping that very monastery. So we can draw a monastic landscape around every single monastery, but probably this landscape will be different if we look for direct physical sources of the monastery, building material, income from the estates, things like that, or the intellectual landscape of this monastery, contacts of a monk being a botanist or contacts of a monk being a good translator of Greek text and so on. So that's a modern concept, but it's, it's applicable to this. And what is always useful for us, case studies of individual monasteries representing different things. So this is what I try to combine here. And as a result of that, I, I will use more or less this kind of things, text as an object of transfer, because the text is also an object. So it's a physical object. The regula, which is the basic rule, but which is also personal experience. If you read, for example, the Benedictine regula, it always comes that if it's not, it's not worded like that, but in our modern reading would be, if it's not regulated in other ways, then what counts is the word of the abbot. And so it's flexible in that way, and still that is the written regula, which is the basis of the life of these people. Translation. Translation means recontextualization in this respect. We are not simply translating texts here, but we are translating things, we can call it cultural transfer, 
we use this term today. But the main point is that we take out from one milieu one thing and we put it into a totally different one and we hope that we translate. But it's of course very limited in some ways. Transmission, then we also need sometimes, you know, it, it cannot be done. Maybe there should be a transmitter, maybe there should be an envoy. Or in the case of mission, maybe you need a martyr who is the transmitter, who tried to transmit but failed. But that's a transmission. Actually, it's a very powerful tool of transmission, not for the martyr, but maybe for the next generation. And in that respect, think about the language, how often we can read in Vitae that the person who went to do mission tried to explain things to those pagans and so on desperately <laughs> and failed. What was the problem? For example, did not speak the language, but hoped to convince them even in that way. So this is all in the background. Now, about mission, uh, we have to see one very particular question. This is what uh, we have realized, interestingly, in another research project. More years ago, there was a research project about the Christianization of different parts of Europe. It was led by Nora Berend from Cambridge and various people took part in that from Scandinavia, from Poland, from Hungary, from Bohemia and so on. And we compared the process of Christianization because in this respect it happened roughly around the same time. So what is interesting that in this part of Europe around year 1000, so in great around year 1000, something new emerged, what we can call Christian monarchies. So these countries were baptized, state formation and the emergence of medieval Christian monarchies. And they emerged around the same time in Europe. So the idea was let's compare them and see how it is possible. What are the common things? What are the differences? And I'm not, re it has been published, so it's Cambridge University Press volume. Uh, but for me, the most interesting result was that I went to this work as participant of the team with the idea that, of course, mission is monastic. So if you want to do mission in some parts of a previously pagan area, monks and other clerics, let's say, are walking hand in hand to that hostile land. Not. Not in Scandinavia, for example. In Scandinavia, monasticism is a very belated thing. It's the very last phase of Christianization. It has been already Christianized, even in the rural countryside, when the monasteries are appearing. In this part of the world, I mean, think about the Benedictine mission to this part, or Benedictine mission in Hungary and so on. This is, this is in many ways the, the earliest thing, what you can imagine. So the say, this issue, then the language of the transfer. So the monastic idea, which is in itself originating from the desert fathers and then comes to Europe, to the Latin word, but at the same time goes to the Byzantine word and arrives to other parts of Europe from two different directions. So we are already talking about at least three languages. And then there is Irish monasticism, which is also playing a role in Central European monasticism as well. So which language? Which is the right language? Which language we have to use the regular? Now, if it's the daily basis, when you enter a monastic community, you have to un understand what is your daily duty, how you are working, when do you have to wake up. Now, but if you don't speak Latin, how do you know when to wake up? If it's part of the knowledge. So, is it the learning process? Of course, it's part of the learning process, but at one point, vernacular is needed. And vernacular is even more needed in the case of mission. I think if we look at the big expansion of Christian missionaries, 
starting with the Mendicants, Dominicans and Franciscans, and then continued by the Jesuits. If we look into the history, language comes up immediately. I mean, translation of certain things. Translation of the Pater Noster to Cuman, to Cuman language, which is up to date the only text what we know in Cuman in some ways, so, I mean, a longer text. So that's, that's the issue of translation, and this is all connected to monastic circles. And finally, we go to something which is always in the background, which is monastic networks. Because we can talk about individual monasteries, that's the Benedictine tradition. Um, today morning there was a, a one point when it was mentioned that um, movement, so somehow monasticism is about movement. I agree, but monasticism is also stabilitas loci, to stay in a place. You enter a monastery for your lifetime and you are only allowed to leave that monastery if the abbot sends you somewhere, at least in certain monastic traditions, because in other monastic traditions it's different. So the Benedictine model is more about individual monasteries. But very soon we have got all kinds of hierarchical networks which emerged in the world of monasticism, usually connected to the reform movements. So there is the Cluny system, which on top you have got Cluny and the lots of priories. There's a Cistercian model with the mother house, filiation, general chapter, visitatio. If you look from modern management viewpoint, this system is amazing. It's an international big organization which has got all the means and ways of controlling the managerial aspects of this hierarchy. And of course the monastic missions, mendicants, Jesuits and so on. So, now Let's take one case study in which I want to show certain aspects to this and it's not surprising that I, I selected the Cistercians. Uh, it's also probably uh, relevant that if it's a workshop which is partially organized by the Centre Francaise de Recherche, then there should be a Cistercian example which is so much French or Burgundian actually in its origin. Uh, so, why the Cistercian network is so useful for this? Because it's a hierarchical monastic network. So, everybody knows its place in that one. It's based on a very intensive communication system, regular and intensive communication system. Monastic houses are everywhere. So in medieval Europe, basically everywhere where is Latin Christianity, even in the Holy Land, the expansion is unbelievable, fast and successful. Most of the foundations will last for hundreds of years. Very few of them can be regarded as failures. And there's a very strong relationship between the political, economic and social tendencies of the certain periods and what's going on with these monastic houses. In other words, their stability is probably explained by the fact that they, are, they have got very rigid systems, but at the same time they are extremely flexible to adopt different conditions and to understand the local situation. And finally, it's you good because there is intensive research on them. So there's, there's a lot happening, uh, good monographs, basically in all European countries. It's very international. Even today, if you go to, for example, to Leeds Congress, which is the largest medievalist congress in Europe, every year there are four, five, six sessions on Cistercians. So if you want to know what's going on, you know. Now, I selected as example the Hungarian medieval foundations, not because it's so important, but it gives us a good number of interesting points. So I'm looking at this from the point of view of chronology and spatial distribution. So when and what happens? Now, if you look into this chronology, 
we can identify three phases. Basically, all the Cistercian monasteries of medieval Hungary emerged, were created, were founded during this relatively short period. First one, 1142, royal foundation, and then after, for decades, nothing. There's not another one. And this is interesting because it is a filia, so the mother house of this is Heiligenkreis, so it's from nearby Austria. But there is a big foundation wave during the reign of Bela III, who ruled in the last years of the 12th century, when there's a whole number of new monasteries, all of them are royal, and what is interesting, they are not founded from a nearby house, but they are all founded from mother houses from France, directly. So there's no long filiation sequence here. And we have, can ask why this happened. And there is a third wave in the first decades of the 13th century, when the big boom of Cistercian foundations are over. So it's not so typical anymore in Europe that many new foundations are made. Still, in Hungary, that's the case in the first decades of the 13th century. Now, if you look into the details, if you look into the individual cases, then uh, you see a good number of things. And I will look into a few aspects. One is the royal foundations, so why royal foundations, how? Dynastic contacts in the background. A particular issue is royal burial places and about the filiatio, so this foundation sequence from which mother house what is founded. Now, if we look into the distribution pattern of monastic houses, you, or into the filiatio, if we use that uh, Cistercian concept, you can see that there are different models which are working. One is this um, stone in the pond or wave effect. It's like throwing one piece of stone into a lake which starts waves. The closer you are, the bigger are waves, and then further you go, the smaller they are, the effect is smaller. So it says that if you have got a strong mother house somewhere, then there will be lots of filiations, but they are close to the house. And then as distance grows, it will disappear in some ways. But in some cases, this is not the model which is working. There is a very interesting work. It has been done by a student of mine who analyzed in spatial and in network sense all medieval Cistercian foundations. Uh, so it's nothing else than putting all of them on a map, drawing circles, uh, putting them in a chronological sequence, connecting them according to the mother houses, and looking at the results. It's very simple. And it gives very interesting results because it exactly confirms the idea that the wave I have mentioned at the second part or last decades of the 12th century is totally exceptional. It's not like in many other parts of Europe because of this direct filiation system, because that the new foundations are made directly from certain parts of France. So if you look, this is the sequence when we go into the details, lots of dates and place names, probably you have never heard of them. So the first is Morimon Heiligenkreuz Cicador, so that's 1142, and then already in 1179, Pontigny Egres. Egres is eastern part, it's far. and if we go even further, Egres founds a new place called Kertz. Kertza, it's in Transylvania to get today. It's the furthermost eastern uh, monastery of the Cistercians in that period. It's so far that, for example, the abbot has got a privilege because all the abbots should appear in the general chapter on a yearly basis, but the abbot of Kertz should go only in every third year. Why? because it's so far that otherwise he would be always traveling between. Because the mother house is in Burgundy. So, I mean, 
that, that's, that's about. And think about this issue of knowledge transfer, <laughs> information, transmission, the traveling about was coming and going and so on, stopping at certain monasteries. Now, we can continue like this. This is just a case study. So I, I went through in a detailed way every single foundation, what is behind that, how it is connected to the mother houses, what is the spatial distribution pattern of this, and certainly there emerged a very complex picture. I just would like to show two things so that this first wave, which is so important, so after the very first single foundation, the first wave is directly connected to very strong dynastic connections. So when the king happened to marry Margaret of France, the sister of the French ruler. And we can say, OK, that explains everything. It explains a lot, but actually it explains things in the other way around as well, because it seems to be that those clerics who were crucial in the negotiations for this marriage, they were not newcomer in this field, because before they became important figures of the Hungarian church, they studied in Paris. So this is the movement. University people going home, becoming important in the royal court, influencing the royal decision making, then a royal marriage which reinforces the contacts between the two areas, which is resulting in new foundations. So it's such a complex situation. Or if you look at the early 13th century, you may say that, oh, it's very interesting that we still got Cistercian foundations at that period, but it's even more interesting because this is a part of Europe which has got one of the earliest mendicant foundations as well. So you have got two parallel and in some ways competing monastic circles. And what is the reason for the early presence of the Dominicans and Franciscans, particular Dominicans? Because they want to do mission. Where can you do mission? In the East. So where do you need to establish houses in the closest area? So this is the, now, political power. And I looked into one particular issue, is how political power is connected to the burial places of kings and queens. And there is a surprising thing, namely that, uh, at the turn of the 12th and 13th century, suddenly royal burials change in medieval Hungary. The pattern is different, and one of the places where they appear are Cistercian monasteries. Never before, and not really later. So what's the reason? What's going on here? Now, one of the examples is uh, where we have got such a royal burial is the Sister Abbey at Pilish. It's one of the largest one. It's an absolutely crucial site. And it's uh, uh, very much excavated. It's a, it was a ruin, hardly visible, but we have got very important results of the archaeological investigation, so we can built lots of uh, ideas, conclusions on that one. Now, just to give you a, an idea about what sphere we are dealing with here, so it's not only royal burial, but for example, in art history, it's a common place that the first phase of French style Gothic art, which appears particularly architecture in this part of the world, is connected to two places one is Estergom, which is the capital, the royal uh, palace, and the, the other is, is the Pilish Abbey. So we are in the 1170s, 80s, and you already have got French-style Gothic architecture in these two places. This is very early. Decades later comes the second wave. What is the background? Art historians are telling us Bela III and his marriage to Margaret of France. So we are at the same place. 
But it's interestingly, for a long time it was argued that it's our Estergom, the royal palace, which is the earliest. More recently, it is argued that it's actually not the royal palace, it's the Cistercian Abbey, which is the first phase. So think, let's stop here with this chronology, filiati, and so on. How can we call the appearance of French style Gothic architecture complex knowledge transfer? I mean, it's an entirely new concept of architecture with practices of different practices of stone carving, doing different design of the building, lots of lots of So it's not like I'm sending you a ground plan and you built a new monastery there according to the new French style. It's impossible. Are we talking about moving workshops? This is the idea of what art history so much liked for many decades, uh, or moving workshops, leading masters, concepts, and so on. So what is in this? And just uh, two publications about this site. One of them was dealing with the archaeological excavations. The other is a more recent project, which was dealing with not with the first phase of this monument, but with one of the second phases, because one of the earliest royal burials is Queen Gertrude's or Queen Gertrude's burial place in the Abbey, which is a very symbolic thing in Hungarian history. I only need to mention that this wife of the king who was killed in an assassination, so it is a horror story, probably the best known criminal story in Europe, which <laughs> you know, got out from Hungary. And uh, just to add something more to the importance for historiography, it's the topic of the first and most important Hungarian national drama. And it is the topic of the most important Hungarian national opera. So then, then you understand where we are if you are dealing with the historiography of this. And everybody until very recently argued that the queen was buried there because it's in the middle of a woodland and she was buried there because she was doing hunting in that woodland and she was killed there in that hunting by the assassination. And therefore it was just nearby and she was buried there. And then there was an anniversary of this event. Anniversaries are good for exhibitions and books and publications. And it turned out that it's not. We have got actually evidence, which is known for a long time but hasn't been analyzed. That there's no reason to believe that she was buried there because the assassination happened there. The reason must be different. And I myself contributed to this and I'm saying, I'm convinced, that this burial is actually the first example of a royal change of policy in which royal burial places are in royal Cistercian abbeys. And that's the even more interesting thing that archaeological excavations found, fragments, many fragments of this burial monument. It's an exceptional monument, it has been debated over and over again how we can reconstruct it, who was the master of it. It's totally exceptional in its quality and things like that. Now, let's see. If we look simply into the pattern of royal burials, we can easily argue, yes, it's something fundamentally new. In the 11th century, there is a tradition Royals are buried in their foundations, whether they are monasteries or cathedrals, that's the pattern. 12th century is a change because after the canonization of St. Stephen and the translatio of his body in the Basilica of Székesfehérvár, royal burials and coronations are basically happening in the Basilica of Székesfehérvár, like in the late Middle Ages as well. But in the early 13th century, the pattern changes 
And interestingly, some kings are buried in cathedrals, some kings are buried in Cistercian abbeys. What is behind this? So, I mean, is it, is it connected to knowledge transfer? Is it a change of idea? Is the Cistercian order playing a role in that, or it just happens? Now, what emerged from this research is that, of course, it's not just happens. So first of all, the first burial has nothing to do with the place of the assassination, and there is a royal plan. So it seems to be there's a shift, there's a change. The dynasty and rulers of this dynasty have got an idea that the proper resting place is a Cistercian abbey, or several Cistercian abbeys, which can come into the question. And if you look around in Europe, you see it's a pattern. It's a pattern in many different parts of Europe. So the order, which was very strict on burials in its early history, and started to change its attitude, particularly to founders and later to patrons, is changing its attitude, and it actually, from the 1180s, it is promoting royal burials in their abbeys, everywhere. You can find it in France, you can find it in Austria, you can find it in Scandinavia, in the Iberian Peninsula, and so on. So, it's a total change. Now, again, what does it mean? How does it happen? The abbots are gathering for the general chapter, and then they say, look, we are not any more strict about royal burials. Actually, you can promote royal burials. We don't know anything about this communication because it's not recorded. So we have to deal with, with a major change, which is happening on a European scale. It's connected to the organization and the functioning of a Cistercian monastic network, which is influencing local dynastic politics. And how does it work? What, and it's going at the same time, like the shift from late Romanesque to early French Gothic architecture. So this is the issue. And of course, it's in the context of all local. So I just listed here a few things. For example, we know that these places, what are uh, possible sites, like the Pilish Abbey, they were part of an itinerant king system, which is probably disappearing around this time. And some of these earlier royal houses, which were on the journey route of the king, they are transformed into monasteries, like Cistercian monasteries, or many of them Pauline monasteries, which is a different order, a different monastic tradition, but it has got an importance. It's the only Hungarian-founded monastic order. So one is the big international, which is present everywhere in Europe. The other is the local. And which ruler is supporting what and in which way? That's, again, an interesting issue. Now, I would like to finish very quickly with another case study, which is uh, about the same area, but it's not about royal things. It's not about royal burials, but it's about this archaeological site, which is a grange. It's an economic center of the same Pilish Abbey. Now, Pilish looks like this today and probably looked like very similar in the Middle Ages. Today it's a national park. It's a protected nature reserve. And probably the most important reason that we have got this woodland area very close to Budapest, which is an intact woodland, there's no industrial development inside. There are only three villages in the inner area. The reason for that, that this woodland was a royal hunting domain and forest in the Middle Ages. 
And the only colonization which happened in that was monastic. There were four monasteries in that area, all of them royal foundations. So there is no proper colonization. There are no peasant villages in the inner area. There are no lord's castles in the inner area. It's, even if it's not a royal domain by the end of the Middle Ages, because these monasteries had their own domain, it is basically survived like that. And because of the interesting early modern and modern history, it survived like that up to modern day. Now, this is what we are talking about. So the hilly area, which is uh, this kind of, it's now very popular to call it heart-shaped uh, hilly region. There's the Danube Band, and the listed sites are all important medieval centers, partly royal, partly episcopal, partly important uh, monastic sites. And this hilly area is the woodland, which is in between them. Now, if you look on a map, in the Middle Ages, that was the pattern of settlements in the inner area, four monasteries, one Cistercian, three Pauline. And there were all kinds of interesting works uh, on this very recently. For example, some scholars used GIS technology to reconstruct road system in that area, which concluded that we have got a very strange road in that area, which is crossing the whole area, connecting the two important centers, Obuda and Estergom. And this is not a road like many other roads in the Middle Ages. It's a kind of fast motorway between two royal centers. And you can demonstrate it with modern technology and GIS that the layout, the structure of the road is actually different. Or there was analysis of all the settlements based on charter evidence and archaeological field survey. Look at the inner area, how empty it is. And it's not a high alpine region. It's, it's nothing. It's, we're talking about 400, 500 meters high hills and valleys between them. So the reason that there are not a, a dense settlement network there is not the geographical condition. It's connected to this very fact that it's royal woodland and monastic landscape. Now, these are some of the results of these uh, studies which studied the settlement system, the road system. And the main point is that we have got roads which does not fit to the settlement system, to the medieval settlement system, which means they are not connecting the settlements to each other. They are only connecting the two royal centers to each other. And there is one thing on that road. Guess what? The Pilish Abbey. So if you want to get from one royal center to the other, the fast way, the nice way, is to cross the hill. And the only basic stop is this big royal abbey. So it's, uh, it's a kind of argument for saying that it's not only architecture, it's not only royal burials, but there is more behind. There's landscape organization, there is the royal domain structure, and things like that. Now, this grange, what I'm talking about, is also along that road. It's not sitting on that road, but it's very close. And it has got a very complex history, starting from a village of blacksmiths, then donated to the uh, Sister Shanebi of Pilish. And based on archaeological evidence, at one point we say glass production on large scale appears in this place. And we also have got traces of big medieval water systems. Now, why glass production is interesting? because two aspects. One of them, it's a very complex technology. So it's not like, OK, let's, let's do glass from tomorrow, and we do it as we can. And the second is market. It's still very much a luxury object in the Middle Ages, even in the late Middle Ages. So you need to have market 
And the market is the royal court and the big towns. And both of them are around this area. And you need one more thing for glass production. In large quantity, wood. And you have got there as well. So site selection is obvious. The question is why Cistercians are involved in this business? How did they get to this idea? Now, this is the site today. And we have carried out an archaeological excavation in this site. This is the plan of the site. We have indicated with A, B, C, D, all kinds of medieval things, the ruins, the water system, the buildings, terraces of the landscape, management, and things like that. It's not a spectacular site, so it's nothing like big buildings and so on. These are humps and bumps in the, in the woodland. But if you excavate them, uh, and you survey them, you will find out that it's a big building complex. It has got a church in the middle. It doesn't look like as a church because it's before the excavation. It's a small chapel and there are three wings around it, which are glass production workshops. And each wing is something like um, 30 meter by 8 meter, each wing. It's big. In medieval sense, it's factory size. So it's large-scale industrial production of glass with a church in the middle, which is a chapel, which is a characteristic feature of a Cistercian Grange. Now, we have excavated this church. This is how it looks like. It's, again, still not a spectacular church. It's from the 12th century. Um, but what is important, and more important, not really the architectural details. We are certainly not talking about, you know, beautiful Romanesque architecture here. You can hardly recognize the church itself. But we have got a history. We have got a nice corpus from the 12th century, only find, found accidentally with metal detector. That's the usual thing today. But what we have found is quite intensive traces of glass production on large scale with objects, byproducts, elements of kilns, waste material, and final products. So I just go very quickly through these images. So this is it. So you have got the elements of the furnace or of the kilns, large vessels, which were the melting pots of glass, the glass products, the slags. These are these individual elements. Um, they are not spectacular pieces, but you can actually reconstruct the production technology. Large vessels in which you still got the melted glass, frozen melted glass. And then, as I said, byproducts, waste, uh, ready-made objects, of course, fragments of them. They are not spectacular. They are looking brownish. They don't look like as glass. But this huge quantity, we're talking about almost 20 kilogram of these finds, which is rather exceptional in a site. This is, this is it. There's thousands of fragments. And you can identify the pieces. You can create a typology of them. You can find out how they were made. And, but what is more interesting here, uh, if we reconstruct them, if we imagine how did they look like, they look like this. So these are not objects from that excavation. These are from nice exhibitions. But believe me, these objects look like this. And the technology is the same. Now, we have got the workshops which we are just excavating. We have got the elements of the kilns in situ found there. And we can connect it to late medieval 15th and 16th century glass production technology. Actually, as we reconstruct the kilns, they look like this. Now, then we can, of course, play around with computer-aided technology. You can do anything, so this is how our architects made a computer-aided reconstruction. How did it look like with the three wings and the chapel in the middle? And of course, you can even put monks on it, that it looks 
very monastic. So with computer, there's no problem to do that. They are proper, actually. So this is what we are talking about. But more than just having fun with these images, let's see into this. What does it mean? How does it fit into the history of this monastery? And I just made a short list of what's going on with this monastery. So it's founded, the, the, the big royal monastery, it's founded in the late 12th century. It's one of the biggest, it's most important. Early 13th century, another important phase with the burial of Queen Gertrude, with new building phases, so it's still flourishing. Second half of the 13th century, competition appears. The other monasteries which are founded in the closest neighborhood, they are not animal Cistercian, they are Pauline. 14th century, mid 14th century, we know that the king orders a visitatio. Why? Because there's a big crisis going on. And we also know that even in the 15th century, there's something wrong and there's a new reform, new abbots are coming, new management, and so on. So we can look into the economic system of this, because if it's about crisis, recovery, and so on, we have to see what's in the background. This is actually uh, from the work of a doctor, a student of mine, who I hope in the really nearest future will defend his dissertation, which is on the economy of these monasteries and on the granges. And we can clearly see that Pilish is number one there. And this is the site, this is the monastery which does not have big estates, does not have many granges. What does it mean? They have to be very good in their estate management. Otherwise, they cannot survive. And if we look into the written sources, we usually can have these long texts. And this is on which we can rely on what's going on. So if we just read this Latin text, which are either from the general chapter text or from charters connected to the monastery, we learn that there are big problems in the 13th century. I mean, if you read this terrible story, what happens in the early 13th century, Conversus brothers, lay brothers, are burying somebody alive. So, you know, that's, that hits the general chapter. So something is not good there. And then there are other problems there. But look what's happening in the mid-14th century when the king orders the visitatio, not only of this monastery, but all the Cistercians. It says, in temporalibus vehementer collapsum est. So, or the other in spiritualibus et temporalibus quasi omnino desolatum. What does it mean? Spiritually and material, this is in ruins. So this is not a royal monastery. I mean, what, what happened here? They do not have income. The king is not supporting them. The king decided that the, he needs a proper report. So he asked uh, the abbot of... Abbot of uh, Austrian monastery to come to Hungary and visit all these monasteries. This is from that abbey, some modern piece of art, but above them you can see the pictures of the former abbots, at least as they were imagined in the 18th century. And the one abbot whom we are talking about is still depicted in the 18th century that this is the abbot who visited all the Hungarian monasteries by the request of the king. So that was his most important act in monastic memory. Now, the result is, it's clear that there is a problem. They are not functioning, they are not working properly. Their management is a disaster. This is what we would say today. And they are still in the system, they are still part of the Cistercian network. So how can it happen? Now, we learned that as a result of this royal intervention, there is a revival. There's a new architectural phase, and there is a new economic system. The Grange is reorganized. There's a new building phase of the Grange as well. 
and we don't know at the moment, or we do not have yet the full proof, but it looks that the glass production is connected to that revival. Now, what does it mean? It means that they took over a complex technology from another monastery of the order. There were plenty, either in southern Germany or in Bohemia. We know a good number of Cistercian monasteries who were dealing with glass production. Now, the question is, how did it happen? Is a new abbot coming from there? Is a new manager coming from there? Only the workers are coming. So what does it mean? It's knowledge transfer in a monastic network of something very complex. I want to argue that introducing large-scale grass production to a monastery is first a major financial investment. It's a crucial issue about technological knowledge transfer and it requires a totally new type of estate management. It's not like cutting trees. It's, it's much more, and it's market-oriented. So either at this time or another time, and when I say another time, there is not only glass production is going on, because we also know that at a certain point they introduce a new water system to the site, which is a sequence of ponds and probably at certain point mills. Uh, whether it happens in the 14th century or later, we don't know because we have got another crisis in the 15th century with another revival. At this time we know exactly that it was a German abbot who came and took over. He was quite a strong guy. He had we know it quite well because he had many legal cases with everybody around the monastery. So he took over things which probably belonged to the monastery or probably never belonged to the monastery. And because <coughs> of that, large and long legal cases started. And we know that. So what does it mean? Certainly, even a hundred years later, there were certain issues with management. And it can also happen that at that time, another management model was taken over. And it's even possible that we can have a period when it was a secular investor who was involved in the whole business. There's not a single written text about this, but at the moment I have no other way to explain that how it is possible that in that very chapel, which was in the center of the Grange, at one point they started to produce glass. In other words, they transformed a church into a workshop. Can we imagine this in a monastic milieu? It sounds very strange, but the facts are there. So what I'm saying here, for this monastery, we have got at least two major periods when it required a total reorganization of the daily running of the monastery. Probably the daily prayers as well. I mean, if we believe into these texts, believe in these texts which said that spiritually and materially it is in ruins, Probably spiritually means that they were not behaving like monks. They were not doing the daily things of the monks. And what is the knowledge transfer? What is the way of transmission which was used in that period? And how it is possible that in a relatively short time it has recovered. So a kind of conclusion. Um, Artistic production, architecture of the Abbey are so complex issues, including industrial production, that we can only understand it as complex information packages, which requires the movement of people, the movement of texts, of objects, experience, knowledge, workshops, and things like that. 
It also means that it's not only one technology, but it's the whole way of thinking about estate management. And if we imagine estate management on this large scale, again, this is something which is not simply, I take a text and I tell that from tomorrow you organize it in a different way. And the monastic production site itself has got all these aspects which you can probably detect. But I also want to argue that this is not something alien for a monastic community because, for example, founding a new monastery, so the filiation, means total transmission of an idea from here to there into a very different milieu. And therefore, I would like to argue, and that's my final conclusion, and I'm actually very much convinced in these conclusions, having heard the papers today, that if we want to understand these things, it's only possible if we have got a holistic view about monastic life. And monastic life means prayer, hymns, regular, transmission of text, movement of codices, but it means also estate management, building technique, pieces of art, and even more, transmission of ideas. How did it happen? That's the question for us. Thank you for your interest. My question is about one event that you didn't mention and I thought maybe it influenced uh, the monastic network is the Mongolian invasion. Mm -hmm. And to what extent did this, did this uh, act as a sort of turning point? And did monks return to these um, monasteries after the invasions? And did it look the same? How much did it impact these networks you're talking about? Yes, uh, it's definitely influenced. We have got a few cases when uh, we have got exact written records saying that because it was burned down and was destroyed and uh, there are a few places where it said that all the monks were killed. So, and there are certainly places where there is not really a recovery after that. Uh, and there are some other places where we can speculate about this. So, for example, in the case of uh, this site, this Villa Kovaci, which is originally called Villa Kovaci, which means the village of the blacksmiths. It was a service people settlement of the king. So they were blacksmiths who produced goods for the king. And it was donated at one point to the abbey, the village and the people. And it ceased to exist sometimes in the 13th century. Now, the question is, were these the Mongols who definitely, you know, destroyed many villages around Buddha and Pest and so on? Or was it the monastery itself which moved away these people and moved them to another place? Or just they ran away and they went to settle in the, I don't know, in the in Estergom because there was a good market for blacksmiths and they simply left in the cows after the Mongol invasion their settlement and their monastery and they went to the town and they became free people there, which is possible. We just do not have the source for that. But what we know exactly, and this is, this is probably the answer for your question, that there are certain regions of the country, particularly in the southeastern area, where there was a dense monastic network before the Mongol invasion, and it disappeared. And what is important in that, that it's not simply the monasteries. So the disappearance of the monasteries is probably connected to the Mongol invasion and the destruction, but not having a recovery is actually more connected to the fact that the whole settlement system was destroyed there. So there is no supporting settlement system, no supporting population which can support these monasteries. So the recovery is equally an important question here. Somehow brought to my mind 
how interesting it would be to look into the actual reasons for um, the disintegration of monasteries in the 15th century Bohemia, um, because so far we were much too content with the idea that they were burned down by the Hussites or the monastic communities left or certain things like that. But in many cases, they had some sort of survivals for, for mm -hmm. some time, and up to, let's say, mid 16th century, they were inhabited um, by someone. The disintegration happened also in the Catholic towns. So that also tells us that the uh, maybe that sort of change of the um, of the overall support around, so the economic support, the cultural support, so you know, change uh, in the um, in the population what they or what they needed monastery or did not need monastery is probably more responsible um, than the Hussite themselves in, in many cases because uh, when they brought the new um, well, whether, whether the monastery, monasteries were revived or, or refounded, and we speak about the Franciscan observance, um, mainly these are very specific type of orders, um, like uh, very strict orders, for mm -hmm. example, and, and the, the Jesuits as a, as a particular case. So what are not revived are the old um, monasteries or the, the, the old orders, because they somehow are not complying with the new conditions very well. I mean, would, would be a very simplified view of, of that. One thing which um, I would ask about, and I didn't hear it in the presentation, when we speak about knowledge transfer, um, would maybe schools play mm -hmm. a role in it? Do you know more about that? Yes. Um, so for the first comment, I very much agree with you, and I think this is an important issue. Uh, uh, I've got an impression now that uh, nowadays there are lots of projects going on. Probably we will hear tomorrow about some, I'm sure, because I know some of them, which is mapping, listing, collecting all the data about monasteries in a certain area and a certain region in a certain period. Now, this is in itself very interesting because, I mean, we lack these good data collections. But what is more interesting, and it's already emerging now, that you can look, look into these data sets and figure out that we can actually use monasteries as indicators. Indicators that how many monasteries and what type of monasteries can live in a certain area. So if you have got an increase in numbers or in a decrease in number, it can indicate certain things. Now the indicator character is of course complex because it can be equally economic and spiritual. So like the question of the Mongols, we may say they were killed, destroyed, that's the end of the story. But probably that's the end of the story because there is no supporting population which can make a recovery if there is an attempt for the recovery. The same thing can be spiritual. We see the positive and the negative sides of that. So I agree with you, the 16th century is in many ways a very interesting question. Why in certain areas, even where the Reformation is appearing, mendicants, particularly some Franciscans, can go on for quite a while, some others not. What is the reason behind? Why these strict monastic orders are appearing and reappearing from time to time? Take the Cartusians. I mean, the Cartusians are this very strict group of people, very hermetic, very remote places. And then what we see in the mid 14th century, there is a Cartusian boom all over in Europe. And where, where they do appear, in two contexts, towns, urban Cartusians in Italy, 
urban countries in this part of the world, Bruno and places like that, and then also in other places where it's connected to rulers' court. So it looks that there is a shift in spirituality and this order can offer something. So it's not purely economic question in that sense, but we may say the appearance of Cartusians in certain regions in certain numbers can be used as an indicator probably for a change of spirituality, things like that. Um, now the second thing, yeah, the schools. The problem with the schools that if you look, and that's, that's a typical problem, if you look into the order history of one monastic order, then it's a big debate. There's a big debate recently resurfacing on the schooling and educational system inside the order of the Franciscans and then the Dominicans and so on. But it's always done in the context of the given order. Very little is done in this comparative way. And we, we of course have to differentiate between formal education for their own members, so for the novices and schooling of the future monks, and schools offered for others. And the problem with this is that for the two things we have to look into different types of sources. Because the one type of source for the monastic one you will find in the monastic sources. For the other probably you will find in the uh, context of urban sources. And we cannot really often connect these things. i give you one example. It is uh, well known in educational history, at least in the Hungarian, that we have got one single data which says that there happened a miracle, this is how we learn about such things in the Middle Ages, that there was a young boy who went home from the school and was tired and went to sleep and the stone wall collapsed on him. And then he was found dead after the pieces of stone and then in a few hours while the mother was praying to a saint, uh, he recovered and became alive again. This is the info, which says, it's 13th century, that there was a school in that settlement. No idea what school. Was it a mendicant school? Was it the school of the town? Who went to such? It's in this part of the world, it's so little what we have got about this, and also in the monastic context. There must have been, but we don't know. <laughs>